we will be recording this and we will be sharing it later on YouTube for those of you who wanna watch it again or share it with um, friends and colleagues, uh, we'd be happy for you to do that. This is an interactive discussion which features the stories of four farms and five farmers connecting food, culture, and farming practices known as regenerative with their roots in indigenous, African, and other heritages. I'm Elizabeth Beggins. I'm the Maryland Agriculture Outreach Specialist for the Million Acre Challenge, which is a collaborative project with six founding organizational partners, as you can see on this slide, and an aspirational goal of a million acres of Maryland agricultural land in regenerative practices by 2030. If we wanna advance the next couple of slides, that would be great. You'll notice on this next slide, our mission and vision, and that both are farmer focused. For the Million Acre Challenge, farmers are the heart of the solution to transformative changes in the future of agriculture in the Chesapeake region. Our goal at the Million Acre Challenge is to help them become more profitable and more resilient by creating opportunities for shared learning, research, and funding. Here's a couple of things that we want you to know about the Million Acre Challenge. Um, just kind of a little bit of a PSA. Forgive me, I went one slide too many. Let's see if I can get this to go back. There we go. Um, first of all, farmers, we encourage you to count your acres by um, roll, enrolling in the Million Acre Challenge. It's a very simple Google form that you can access from our website, which is listed at the top of this slide. We don't sell your information. We don't spam you with loads of emails that you don't want. We too are farmers and we are just too busy and we know nobody wants that. So this enrollment is just a way for us to track progress um, toward the million acres and to help us build this vibrant community of like-minded producers. We are working with NRCS on a regional conservation partnership program that will fund um, soil health and climate smart practices for a range of production systems and scales. If you want more detail about that, you can use the QR code that's on this slide to link to our most recent newsletter. And there's a lot of detail there about that. The best way to keep in touch with us is through our social media channels. I'd really like you to take a minute right now to go to any or all of those channels that I've mentioned in this slide um, and go ahead and follow and like us so that you kind of get up-to-date information on the Million Acre Challenge. As I said earlier, we don't send a lot of emails, so this is your best way to keep in touch with us. My colleague, Lisa Garfield, is listed at the bottom of this slide, um, and she and I, working for two different organizations, are available for future follow-up, questions, concerns, ideas, anything that you might wish to share with us. Today's event has been the product of many weeks of collaboration and effort, much of it from our fabulous event coordinator, Adrian Granston. Adrian operates Kushiba Earth Farm in only Virginia, with her husband and four children. They are avid self-directed educators and artists building sustainable systems on their farm and forest property. They're fascinated with the soil food web, inspired by ancient farming methods, regenerative strategies, and the niche and specialty food markets. Adrian currently also works remotely in the computer software and mobile app industry as a legal operations paralegal and part-time as a realtor on the peninsula of the Eastern Shore of Virginia. The farm website will be added to chat in just a couple of minutes so that you can follow up on her. Our moderator, our moderator today is the amazing KPA Fajing Basie, 
Tope is a US certified public accountant and a Nigerian chartered accountant. She is also an African food focused social entrepreneur and a published author. She served as the assistant director of the American Federation of Teachers and as an outsourced financial consultant for several Washington DC organizations. Passionate about serving her US and Nigerian communities, she co-founded United for Kids Foundation and hosted the radio program, Impact Africa. Tope frequently speaks to global audiences with a mission to inspire, and she has done so both locally, nationally, and internationally. Tope is married to Niyi Balagun, a farmer who manages their joint venture, Dodo Farms, which is a certified naturally grown produce farm in Montgomery County, Maryland. Her full bio and a link to um, the farm will be added to chat in just a moment. Our panelists to Tope will introduce in more detail as we move along are Gloria Romano Barrera and her husband Josue Barrera of Glory Fields, Hacienda Barrera, Vanessa Bolin of Community Roots Garden, Michael Carter of Carter Farms, and Samaria King of Juniper's Garden. We are so grateful for their willingness to spend time with us today, despite incredibly busy schedules, to tell their own agricultural stories, how they came to the land, what culture and ethnic uh, influences they brought with them, and how they are moving forward toward regeneration today. And with that, I'm going to hand the talking stick off to Tope to introduce our first panelists. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. I have five pages of these bios. These are very impressive bios, but I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to do my best to give you an idea of who the impressive panelists that we have are. I'm going to start with Josue Barrera and Gloria Romano Barrera. They are the owners of Glory Fields, a small scale farm located on the Mayan Moyaan Reserve in Akokik, Maryland. Their interests lie in positive stewardship of the land using natural integrated sustainable practices as they grow vegetables, herbs and flowers and raise bees, chicken, duck, guinea and soon sheep. They moved to Southern Maryland in 2015 for a change of pace after 10 years of living and working in the city, Washington DC that is. Though raising a family in an open space was the initial motivation, they soon recognized the possibilities of an almost six acre tract of land. The original thought was to grow fruit and veggies. They like to eat and share with their friends. After a summer of endless tomatoes, tomatillos, peppers, jalapenos, papayo, and more, Glory Fields was in business. Neither Josue nor Gloria came to farming with any substantial hands-on experience. Born and raised in the Bronx, New York, Gloria traces her farm experience to her mother's family, who were subsistence farmers in rural Mexico. She spent time as a child beside her grandfather as he would harvest alfalfa in the fields. Her memories also include harvesting pears from her grandmother's trees. Jose was born in Flint, Michigan, to a family of migrant farm workers. Both his maternal and paternal ancestors worked in monoculture, pig ag, cotton fields of Texas vineyards of California and cherry orchards of Michigan. As they reflect on their ancestors' cultural heritage and respective history with the land, they grow more inspired to learn and adopt regenerative practices. In addition to their farm responsibilities, Gloria is the managing editor for a national publication, and Josue maintains an off-farm career in foreign affairs and national security. On a typical day, you find them balancing conference calls with Fortune 500 executives or diplomats all tending to their farm. They are two sons and cat and dog. Oh my goodness, they are busy. I'm so happy they're here. Michael Carter Jr., who by the way, Michael, my husband needs this to say hello to you. He's an 11th generation farmer in the United States and is the fifth generation to farm on Carter farms. His family's century farm in Orange County, Virginia, where he gives workshops on how to grow and market ethnic vegetables. He acquired an agricultural economics degree from North Carolina a and State University and has worked in Ghana, Kenya, and Israel as an agronomist and organic agricultural consultant. In addition to working as a small farm resource center coordinator for Virginia State University and serving on numerous farm and food system related boards of directors, he also consults with numerous governments, 
organizations. Like and everything, I haven't really felt stuck in my anger. There. And individuals. Mm -hmm. But I can give an example where when you it comes to my dad, how I've stayed in anger. Thank you very much. He consults for governments, organizations, and individuals throughout the region and nation on food access, food security and insecurity, market outreach, social and economic um, equity evaluation projects. He also deals uh, with racial understanding, immersion, history, and cultural training, among other areas, through his educational training and um, among other areas. Through his educational, cultural, cultural and vocational platforms, Hen Assem, which means our story, and Africulture, teaches and expounds on the contributions of Africans and African Americans to agriculture worldwide and trains students, educators, and professionals in agricultural, in African cultural understanding, empathy, and implicit bias recognition. He happily assists his sons in running their respective businesses, Carter Brothers and Sunnyside Entertainment, went on homeschooling his three youngest son. Um, I want to make sure that I did not skip Vanessa. Yes. Vanessa Bolin is an indigenous farmer, artist, activist, and founder of the Eyes Wide Open Project, Richmond Indigenous Society and Community Roots Garden. She sits on the board of Ogalala Lakota Cultural uh -huh. Economic Initiative and Mutual Aid Disaster Relief National. She studied paramedic medicine at Virginia Commonwealth Four, University. Vanessa two, served as a medic three, in Standing Rock four, during the. Five, uh, please six. mute yourselves if you're not speaking. Please mute yourselves. Vanessa served as a medic in Standing Rock, North Dakota during the No DAPL movement and traveled to Houston after Hurricane Harvey and acted as a medic where she served and cared <sighs> for flood survivors. She established a mutual aid disaster relief warehouse in Robinson, Colorado after Hurricane Florence and has taught medic trainings in multiple countries. Vanessa has recently returned from the, from the Ukraine where she helped provide medical care to refugees. She spends her time in community helping to build and One, grassroots two, organizations three, and provides for Lord. Can, can, we, can we mute everyone so that they can mm -hmm. unmute themselves unless we ask them? We can. I, my apologies. We're going to work on getting those microphones muted. If you do have your microphone on, if you'll take a moment to just hit the mute button in the lower left part of your screen, that way we won't um, interrupt the flow of our conversation. Vanessa spends her time in community organizing, uh, in community helping to build and support grassroots organizations and provides training in marginalized communities educating about food, sovereignty, decolonized, decolonized and integrated medicine, transformative justice, environmental racism, and racist awareness about murdered and missing indigenous women, among other topics. Believing that it is everyone's responsibility to defend this sacred earth, she sets out each day to make the world a better place and is striving to help build the world we all want to live in. Last, but by no means the least, I'm going to introduce Samaria King, who is a farmer, herbalist, and mother. Her work encompasses urban and rural agriculture, farmer education, food justice, and herbal mutual aid. She is the co-founder of the DC Mutual Aid Apothecary, which is a DC-based mutual aid organization that mobilizes herbalists, herbal enthusiasts, farmers, and holistic healthcare practitioners in the region. The organization provides free herbal products, classes, and clinical services. DCMA also provides a space for people to reclaim their ancestral traditions through building relationships with plants and tapping into the world of their families, communities, and cultures. After farming in DC for several years, Samaria recently opened her own family farm with her partner, Blaine, and three children. Juniper Gardens is a small scale farm in Brandywine, Maryland, that grows vegetables, medicinal herbs, dye plants, fiber, and seed crops, and provides cultural, educational, and community-based classes and events. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this amazing panelist that will be um, working with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Tope. And we're gonna circle back uh, to the Barreras and Glory Fields Farm for our first um, presentation. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Tope. We're really honored um, 
to be invited to participate in this discussion. Uh, we were uh, at a loss for why initially until we started learning a little bit more uh, about the organization and where we fit in and, and how much of what we were doing actually syncs well with the vision of Million Acre Challenge and, and regenerative and uh, agriculture itself. Um, we know that these are concepts that are, you know, in flux and being defined many different ways. But uh, as it turns out, and as we're, we're learning as we're going, um, we seem to be pretty consistent with what's out there. So um, as was mentioned in the bio, we moved, both of us came to D.C. as students for our professional careers uh, in 2006. And it wasn't until 2015 till we moved out to this property here in the Moyone Reserve in Southern Maryland, in Akakeek, off of 210 South, if anybody's familiar. Um, it was a bit serendipitous, uh, or providence, uh, however you prefer to, to mention. Um, but we saw this space, wide open space, big open fields and pastures, and started dreaming of the potential. Um, I don't know what we were thinking we were going to do with it. Maybe we thought we were going to be running through fields like Sound of Music, um, but it was not growing and it was not, you know, riding horses as what the property was used for uh, initially. Um, but we saw three paddocks, each about an acre and a half, um, which in, turns out they were severely overgrazed, lost a lot of topsoil. It's a bit of about a five to seven degree grade downhill toward the Potomac. Um, so as we're going along, we learn maybe it isn't the best land to do something. Um, so we've had a lot of, a uh, lot of work to do. Um, but we're learning that there's, there is a way to make this a functional. We're excited about what, uh, the path and the trajectory that we're on, uh, and uh, how it all started, uh, as was mentioned in the bio, it, it turns out that there may have been just something in us that was connected to the land much deeper than we ever gave credit or realized. Uh, you know, even when we were living in the city, we were growing on our balcony, you know, uh, peppers and tomatoes and things like that. Um, and, you know, as we, we've learned along the way, access to land seems to be one of the biggest challenges. And we were, we are fortunate in that we found this place and have moved on into a different level. Um, but as was also mentioned, our hands-on experience is uh, divergent and unconventional to say the least. But here we are now in our fourth growing season and um, the, the leaps and bounds that we have made from that very first um, uh, that very first attempt, I'll say, is is uh, quite uh, quite a ways away. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gloria. Well, thank you. Yes. So, and of course, uh, happy to be here, happy to share our story and hope it will um, someone will learn from our experience as well. And, and uh, I'm going to move forward on to speaking on the slide here. This is me on the on the left, bottom left. Uh, the As you can see, two empty raised beds with our little one. He was probably a year and a few months. We were trying to figure that out um, the past couple of days. But like Jose mentioned, we subconsciously, I guess we, we knew we wanted to do something more um, outside of our professional career, uh, and and thankfully we we found this place, and we as you can see we have the empty beds, and then the next the following year, um, you can see Josue with our little one who is around two two at that point two and a half, and so we had um, learned a little bit more about raised beds and soil about what we can do and the possibilities. Um, and this is not just by accident, I feel. Also we researched and, and um, connected also with other groups, uh, for example, Future Harvest Casa, NRCS, um, the UMD Extension. So they have been very helpful in providing us um, you know, all the resources or as much resources that we uh, can possibly imagine. Um, to help us succeed. Uh, we, we learn from composting, we use mushroom compost. Um, and, and so it's not just about soil building uh, and it's not just about, um, you know, getting out there and eating healthy, but also the exercise factor, the healthy factor of it. And also learning about our culture. I think that that's a lot of what we've, we've been learning the past couple of years. And so um, 
it's it's been a tremendous experience and so from the raised beds we now grow a little bit more than an acre um and 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 so Josue will move forward on to you know talking about a little bit of our background all right so these are my great grandparents we both, uh, Gloria and I both consider ourselves uh, from Mexican uh, heritage, um, though I use the term Tejano uh, and being a representative mix of the mestizo culture in Texas. Um, I, that, that is part of, part of me. We've, as we've, we, we've been learning, as we've been growing, um, some of their history and the work that they did and how it is, you know, like I said, a part of us. Um, Gloria has a very different life experience being born and raised in the Bronx, though she did spend some time in Mexico, and she'll talk about that in, in her life and experience with, with land. But we, we've learned that we do share this connection much deeper. Um, my, my, as you mentioned, my, my family's legacy is in agriculture, ranching, migrant farm working, uh, but more so on a commercial scale, in, in a big scale, working for the, the, the big agriculture um, commercial agriculture industry. Um, so it was very much in a constricted or defined way and using conventional practices, um, things that we know now uh, are, that we would prefer not to uh, do for ourselves and, and for our, just our own livelihood. Um, well, yeah, no, um, my experience is very limited. Um, I My early memories are from when we used to visit my grandparents in Mexico and, and my grandfather used to take us with him to cut the alfalfa for uh, the cows and the livestock that they had. So there were always chickens all over the place, pigs, cows, uh, pears. My grandma had lots of pears that we used to go and, and pick pears whenever we wanted. So that was fun. Uh, we didn't do the hard work. And so I say fortunately and unfortunately, uh, because at least now I, my, I remember my grandfather used to cut the alfalfa with the sickle. And now I see the sickle and I don't know how to use it. <laughs> so um, it's, it, it was a learning experience. And I remember some, some parts of it where they didn't use any machinery to do any of the hard work. Um, and they knew the importance of of not doing so um, and the way they used to compost. And so we we are kind of bringing that forward now to, to the farm and to how we grow and how we enrich the soil. And so we've seen the big difference um, of even how our fruits and veggies grow when we're not disturbing the land, right? And so I think that subconsciously also on that and um, it, it, it was the learning experience. And then now we even talked to our parents that their life, how, how was it like and what they learned. And even my mom, when she comes over, she will kind of teach us her, or give us, a, give us a, her advice as to how to grow certain um, fruits or certain vegetables, corn with bean and so forth, which is now what, a lot of, what we've learned that a lot Three of folks sisters. do. Um, and at that time, that's how they used to do it. Um, and they didn't have any books to you to, to learn about it. Uh, meanwhile, here we are, you know, trying to, to figure it out. And then we see it on, on other channels or YouTube while my mom goes, okay, this is how my grandpa used to do it. And so it's, it's an interesting, um, yeah. we're using YouTube when we could just use my mother-in-law essentially. <laughs> So yeah, slide. You can move to the next slide. So yeah, that's a little bit of my 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 back end or my experience on farming, um, and how I go about it. This slide, there I am, a broad using the broad fork. It was my first time, I believe, trying to use the broad fork. It was a lot of work. I was tired, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, what we learn is that we're not disturbing the land as much as when we do a, a till or machinery. Um, we were looking at the earthworms and even our little one now he's used to grabbing the earthworms from like straight from the soil. Uh, the 
so these are a couple of our you know, techniques or uh, what we use at the farm. We, we use tarp and, and cardboards and the concept of you know, sustainability and regenerative ag comes into place here um, using uh, mulch or wood chips and rotating the crop. And, um, and again, just learning how to broad for, broad for efficiently so we can, we can keep growing um, our fruits and veggies and flowers. All right. So we, we do a, a few other practices or, or practice a few other things like uh, the tarp, as you mentioned, but the, the, the mulching, as you saw in the opening picture, there is a high tunnel. Uh, thank you to Samaria's partner for helping us put that up. Um, but bees, uh, you know, bringing pollinators in, we want it to be a, a, a you know, self-sustaining ecosystem as much as possible. So we're trying to, you know, have the, the, the ruminants, have the animals, have the bees all, all on the same six acres. And, you know, if we need to move them around as we move them around, we'll, wherever the flowers are one year, we'll put veggies in and swap them out. And so we'll, we'll do all that type of, 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 of moving around and it's extra work. It's, you know, but it's, it's, that's the only way that they're not going to be getting or using the, the same nutrients from the soil. Um, but, you know, we're even doing things like saving our seeds and, 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 you know, that's one of the things that we're really uh, excited about. It might seem super tedious at the time, but making sure that we have seeds that are a customer acclimated to the our current environment, um, you know, we understand and what we've learned is that's going to, you know, provide some resistance and resilience to the the, you know, the future uh, crops that we grow with those same seeds. Next slide. Right. So we've learned that over overall everything that we've done goes back to our culture, our heritage, our ancestors, and how they used to also grow. Um, so it, it's sort of kind of paying homage to our culture and cultural preservation and relevancy. Right here you have on the left slide, uh, it's a root plant, which in Mexico and, and, and probably other countries know of it differently. Uh, for us, we use it for medicinal purposes, uh, home remedies and teas, et cetera. Even um, the, the basil, People, we've learned that different cultures use it for different reasons or ways for us, sometimes with a, uh, for a salad, other folks use it for um, stomach aches. So the herb on the right, we have a papalo, which is a savory herb, um, distinct Mexican flavor uh, that we use instead of cilantro. Uh, for us, we learned that cilantro bolts really easy, uh, really fast. So our use of papalo, it's, um, it has uh, replaced kind of the cilantro factor uh, for our salsas and also, you know, for the folks that are nostalgic, that brings that nostalgia feeling to uh, our community. So we are intentional about what herbs we, uh, we grow. And so we, we're hoping that um, more of the folks get to have a little bit of their past um, here with them. Slide. Next slide. Just to let you guys know, we're we're closing in on our on our time. Okay. Gotcha. We'll finish up real quick. All right. So as you see on the left, there's some packaged herbs that we uh, deliver there to a, a local community. Uh, I guess we, in New York you would call it a bodega. Here it's just a, a you know a little grocery store here, but it specializes in uh, Hispanic goods. Um, Folks saw what we were doing, saw some more of our fields and reached out. And so we've actually done glory, I'll say, not we. I've, uh, I've actually uh, been able to do some weddings. So that's been a fun, uh, I guess, take on, on you know, some of the materials that we're doing. Um, it, it's, it's also interesting that you see some of the varieties there. It's, they do also do have some cultural relevance to different cultures as well. So that's one of the things that we've, we've learned along the way. Um, you can go ahead and slide, finish up here, two more slides. Um, yeah, it, this is just some of the things, uh, if I can point out, uh, pipicha, it's another very um, familiar herb to us, um, and I, if there's one thing that we kind of got, got carried away with, is anything that looked or sounded like it had a cultural relevance or familiarity to us, we tried it, we gave it a shot, and so this is just some of those things that, that were, uh, seemed to work for us. Right, right. And then we also have a couple of the squash, which is the pipian squash, the, the green one, which is specifically used for a certain kind of sauce on, in our culture. 
Um, so just wanted to give a mix of a little items that a few items that we grow here. Um, and yeah, then we can go to the next slide so we can wrap up. I'm sorry, did you want me All to right. back up or go forward? You thought you good last slide. Last okay, slide. I'm so sorry. So sorry. I thought I misunderstood what you said. No, no, no. The next All right, slide. and bringing it back to food, right? This is what, what we're growing, whether if it's if it's for our health or for our, you know our sustainment, it's it's food. This is um, you know, esquitas. People talk about it's really popular if you go to any Mexican restaurant in town, they'll say, Oh, Mexican corn or corn in a cup. Well, if it's um, you know, done the way that's familiar to us, it would have a certain um herb in it called uh, uh epazote. Um, and if you know that that would kind of be an indicator for us that it's gonna be the real deal, if you will. Um, but you know, it's something that we grow here and adds a, an extra kick or flavor to it. But you know the food going um, finishing off with the idea of food and the land it, it's it can be our friend it can work for us not against us if if we are controlling what's being put into it then we can be confident of what is coming out of the land um, and uh, going back to the idea of, of our land um, you know it, it's it's something to sustain us and you know our parents were are concerned were worried when we started this but we encourage them that it's um, it's not constraining it's 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 sustaining and it's working for us and we're letting it work for us um and you know we're encouraged by the the path we're taking and hopefully um you know we it continues to be a joy and a fulfilling uh place for us thank you for your time sorry we went over a little bit thank you thank you thank you so much and i just want to uh, send a reminder that you can add your questions to the chat box as the speakers are making their presentations Comments are also welcome. Just put them in the chat box and the speakers will do their best to answer as we go along. Any questions that have not been answered, we will answer at the end when we have the Q&A section. And of course, the natural disasters. Mother, um, mother weather has uh, robbed us temporarily of our second speaker. Vanessa has had to um, go out because of the storm. So. I would invite my West African brother, Michael Carter Jr. to make his presentation next. Thank you, Sister Tope. I don't see that often. I'm always a, Brun <laughs> a Bruni or a, what do they call me, a Kata when I'm in West Africa. So this is calling my brother definitely helps out a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, Michael Carter, Carter Farms and Agriculture. You can go to the next slide. I'm, um, this is the old barn that my, uh, I think my grandfather and his brothers built back in the 1940s, or early 1950s. Uh, we are a small family farm on, um, in Orange County, Virginia, on about 150 acres of land. Um, the upper left corner is my maternal grandfather uh, with his sheep. And the bottom right corner, I can't point to him, but it's a little guy with like a uh, T-shirt and a real long head. Yeah, go down a little bit further. Right there. That's my father. Long haired little guy. Yeah, that's him. I like to tease him because, uh, yeah, I like to tease him a lot. How did I connect with my African roots? I'll answer that question for you in just a second. So that's our family farm. We've had it since 1910. My great great grandparents purchased our farm uh, November 5th, 1910. Uh, and then we have another piece of property that my great grandfather purchased in April 5th, April 1st, uh, 1915. So we have two pieces of property in the that particular side of the family that um, is over 100 years old. Uh, my grandfather, who's on the, in this particular picture here, has another 20 acres or so we have in Cumberland County, Virginia as well. Um, and, and, you know, we've kind of moved away from kind of traditional farming uh, and really focused on education. One of the things that we try to grow in our farms are more farmers, uh, especially more African, uh, people of African descent farmers. Uh, basically because of our perceptions and our experiences with agriculture. A lot of us have moved away from the agriculture profession. So agriculture and Carter Farms seeks to denote a, a definitely a higher uh, level of respect uh, and dignity to the farming agricultural occupation. Next slide. So that's uh, my father there, a couple years older than that first picture. Um, and this is the you know, the, the picture to the right, you see a couple of tractors going down, land plastic and all that. This is some of the, uh, how I started my process. Um, I returned back to my family farm in 2017 and 2018. 
after living for five years in West Africa, um, I lied to myself and said I was going to West Africa. I'm never going to return back to America again. And I, I almost didn't, but <laughs> I stayed in West Africa for about five years. I returned back to visit, and then the land called me back to stay. Um, I was sitting on a tarmac in Dulles Airport, and I was like, you got to go back home. So we turned back around and uh, came home and started uh, Carter Farms here officially. Uh, the other picture, the three young men, my three youngest sons, uh, the Carter brothers. And, you know, they became my inspiration for why I was doing or why I started the farm and why I wanted to do more things with agriculture. Uh, the gentleman with the straw hat, again, that's my father. He's an agriculture teacher, has been an agriculture teacher all my life. Um, so I was always into agriculture against my will a lot of times. Um, and I didn't always appreciate it. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that this next generation, my sons would be the sixth generation to be on our farm, would actually appreciate and desire to work on the farm, to not run away as soon as the opportunity came. Um, and that became our, our desire. Um, and you know, part of the process with that is you know, kind of approaching or at least adopting new innovations in terms of agriculture. Um, what you see here with them, this is 2017, 2018, 2018, I believe, of the tilling of the soil. It's something that really bothers my heart now. Uh, and almost embarrassed to do it, but it's, you know, it's a learning process. I really wanted to adopt no-till, and I did start doing no-till practices uh, later on because I do strongly believe that there's so much soil health involved in the soil structure of the land. Uh, I'll answer that question just a second as well. Um, so, you know, I want to preserve the microorganisms, the, micro, the microbiome in the soil to get the maximum nutrition out of those plants that we are growing in, in, the, in the land. Uh, one of the questions in the chat asked me, what did I not appreciate about agriculture uh, uh, when I was younger? And what I did not appreciate about agriculture when I was younger was one, it was hot. Usually, you know, you had to be out when it was hot. You had to be out. Uh, generally, when I wanted to play basketball, be with my friends, I was in the garden. Because um, as a youngster, uh, and I say youngster, nine to about 12, 15, 27, uh, you know, I like to sleep. And my father would get up about six o'clock in the morning and start his thing and be done and leave whatever responsibilities he had for me whenever I got up. And I may get up between 10 and one o'clock and during the summertime, that's the high time for play and the high time of heat. Um, and it only seemed to be hot when you was doing agriculture. If I was playing basketball, if I was with my friends, it wasn't hot at all. But if it was, uh, if I was picking beans or weeding, uh, planting things, then that would be, you know, the time that I would really not appreciate it. And then I would hear my uncle, um, and my uncle was an agriculture teacher and a gentleman driving that tractor, Mr. Roland Terrell was an agriculture teacher. They would always talk about agriculture and say how much money they didn't make. And as a young person, you know, that didn't appeal at all. I mean, who wants to do a job or do an occupation where you don't make any money? And that's why we're here all the time. We ain't making no money doing this. We're not making no money. But every year they would do this. So it's like, this is not going to be something I want to do. I actually want to make money. So I'm going to do something totally different. Um, so now with my sons, I showed them the money I make from agriculture. Uh, I call myself a grant farmer. Uh, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. I'm growing grants, supposedly growing vegetables many times. Um, but I showed them, you know, the money I get from speaking, the money I get from teaching or education. Uh, so they can see in real ways you know, that you can really earn a living from agriculture and, you know, you can kind of shape it to your personality and ultimately your generation. Um, so we do a lot of, you know, some technology-based things. We have QR codes on the farm to highlight the various crops and practices that we do. Um, we, you know, try to bring in young people, younger groups and schools and everything else and show them, you know, what to grow and how much you earn from it. Uh, one of the main crops that we grow that gets a lot of attention and I've you know, attracted a few uh, interns from that is hemp. Hemp is the gateway crop for agriculture. If you can get to grow hemp, and I know Virginia it's legal with the, um, uh, with the license and with, and I think in Maryland, I believe it's legal. You know, it does attract young people, you know, and I encourage the young people when they have my farm to be on their phone, to take selfies with the hemp or whatever crops they want to do with, and post them on social media. Those things help my farm and keeps them engaged with it. it's agriculture seems much more as hip than as this, you know, sows, plows, and cows scenario. I'm going to the next slide, please. And these are some of the crops that we grow at our farm. Uh, to the left uh, is Moringa. Uh, we utilize these uh, landscape fabric 
to one, heat up the soil, two, to uh, you know, prevent weeds. Um, that's really the main reason to prevent weeds. I don't like weeding and they still seem to grow a lot of weeds despite it. Uh, the plant in the middle is, in Ghana, they call it Inca turmeric, but you would know it as cocoa yam leaf, um, taro leaf, poi leaf, uh, elephant ear. Uh, and then the one to the left is Nigerian spinach, which is a variety of celosia, Nigerian spinach or uh, Lego spinach. How did I figure out what African plants were best to grow in the US? Uh, I just planted seeds and whatever ones grew. I was like, aha, that's it. <laughs> but the reality is with many African plants, as long as they're not trees, you know, when we start our growing season, we start in May, generally the soil is warm enough to plant any crop. Um, and on top of that, you would have, um, you know, so I, I planted this taro leaf, the one in the middle. When I returned back from Ghana in 2017, I saw some in the store, the roots, and I planted it and in my father's garden and it, you know, it, it grew in September. And next thing you know, you know, we had the worst winter ever in Virginia, coldest winter that I experienced. And that May again, it returned. So that was my indication that I can grow this year round. And this is one of the main ones um, that does very well for me in uh, Ghanaian markets and African markets. Uh, Cause it's none of this is, is available fresh. Um, Moringa to the left, taro leaf, and Nigerian spinach. And when we talk about eating for, or not eating for, we're developing a concept on the farm called eating for your appetite. I'm a strong believer that we need to eat more so for where our ethnicities are from, uh, because those various foods have different nutrient profiles, different needs. African people generally like to be in the sun. Well, so do their vegetables. These, most of these crops are full sun vegetables. You know, European based people generally don't like to be in the sun. And their crops don't like to be in the sun. What happens when you put kale or collards or broccoli in this type of heat in the summertime? They bolt because environmentally it doesn't fit their, their reality. When you put these crops in the wintertime, what do they do? They die back. You know, so these culturally, you know, we have kind of the same things and to help develop a more culturally relevant and, and sound nutritional practices, we have to really explore, you know, some of these other crops in various regions of of the world. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, this is our Juneteenth event that we just had this past weekend. Uh, we highlighted a lot of <laughs> African cultures, you probably can tell. Uh, so these are African flags from all the various African countries. Most of the, you can't see the other flags there. Uh, moon balances, I do a lot of tours there, um, talking about the experience. Because again, what we're trying to grow is more black farmers um, and social disadvantaged farmers. And the best way to do that is to show them you know, various experiences and explain various things from an historical perspective, from a cultural perspective. You know, and I'm a part-time comedian, so I try to throw a joke in there. A lot of folks don't laugh a lot, but I try to throw it in from every perspective possible to keep you know, us engaged. Uh, agriculture has become a monocrop of sorts in terms of how do we approach it and ultimately who's the producers. I think 97% of farmers in the country are roughly white, male or females. And that's, you know, any other crop or any other population of that would be quite unique. And we would probably say we need to diversify a little bit. But in the occupation, we really diversify in terms of farmers. Uh, so we strive very hard to try to make sure that we increase the number of farmers um, of color, Af of African descent specifically, uh, to really help them understand their ancestral heritage to this that many of us have bought here because of our farming expertise. Uh, and many of us have sustained a certain level of farming expertise, no matter the, the challenges we face in this country. Next slide, please. Oh, no, I guess that's probably the end of my side. That's my guy, that's, that's my motivation, that's uh, in our hay field and back, uh, and they got on that thing and took a picture uh, <laughs> back in March. Next slide. Oh, okay, yeah. And that's my father again, and uh, some of the advantages and some of the uh, lessons that he provides uh, it, it is so critical. Um, my father has a unique way of teaching agriculture. Um, I didn't appreciate it when I was younger, but it definitely keeps folks engaged, and I probably adopted it as I got older. And I wanted to make sure my sons also appreciate it, adopt it, and understand the value of it. Um, 
we focus on really growing farmers, growing African crops, telling the stories of those African crops and those African farmers who potentially may have grown the, those crops um, to make a bridge of cultures, of understanding, of purpose and of value. Um, we do a lot of non-traditional things, um, a lot of non-traditional things on the farm. Um, and I, I, we're dealing with various aspects of understandings on the farm. My uncle, who's been the caretaker of the farm for the last 40 years or so, is a very much a green revolution like farmer. He was, you know, he, he likes the fertilizer. He believes in tilling like once a week or once every other day. Um, he uses sprays, you know, whatever when necessary in terms of uh, insecticides and things like that. And we have um, quite a few festive arguments a week, uh, depending on what's going on. Um, but allows us to see the kind of the differences between his approach and my approach. And I've grown to slightly appreciate what he's off to, what he, what he, our differences. You know, I think the only thing we have in common is our last name at this point. Um, next slide. Okay. And this is some of our Nigerian spinach. Again, if you ever get a chance to try Nigerian spinach, it's a great crop. Um, oh, last thing I was going to share is that, you know, with these African crops that we grow, what I've discovered one is that we've grown a whole other level of African weeds. Uh, so we have a, this year planting, we had a fame flower pop up, which I've never seen on the ground. We have a lot of um, horse nettle, which is very close to another green called Foma. Um, and these crops certainly don't need as much irrigation and what I call babying as a lot of crops do. Like a lot of times with our gardens, we got irrigation, we got sprays, we got fungicides. You know, if you're organic or not, you have all these various ways to deal with it. Uh, but that usually speaks to either the quality of, of the seed and the crop or the soil health. Uh, with these crops that we're growing here, we don't spray, we don't water, and they grow just as green uh, and just as healthy, if not more healthy, than most crops that I've grown in the past from a controlled environment. Um, so we're doing a lot of research at Carter Farms in terms of growing for the climate change, and not just the climate change of the environment, but we're trying to push for a climate change of the agriculture industry, changing the climate from a majority, you know, white population to a very mixed, diverse, mono, or multicultural uh, field of farmers and experiences that we can all come to the table with. So with that, I thank you for your time and I look forward to questions toward the end. That's me with my two favorite tools. <laughs> thank you so much. And this last picture just looks right from a Nigerian farm actually. And thank you for, <laughs> for mentioning the Nigerian spinach. You know, I was smiling behind my cameras when I was hearing I, I saw you. <laughs> yeah, we, we try to do a couple other things there as well. We have a, well, a you do the garden egg, and you know we have some pepper, um, right. some some sorghum, some fonio, some teff, uh, some millet. Um, yeah, so we, we try to do a mix uh, of items, and I hope we can keep a smile on your face. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And we'll take, um, of course, questions in the chat. So please keep putting your questions in the chat, and Michael. And um, the Barreras would uh, type responses. Anyone that they don't get to when we get to the q and I am going to um, mention those questions. So um, hopefully Vanessa will still come back to us and the storm will not last long. But for now, I'm going to go to my sister, Samaria King. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Tope and Elizabeth and Adrian um, for putting this together today. Um, it's an honor to be here and talk a, bit, a little bit about my farming background and experience. Um, I am a farmer and herbalist um, and have been um, working in the field of agriculture, urban agriculture, really since about 2013. Um, I'm a mother of three, and so I got into agriculture um, because I was interested in figuring out ways to have healthier food options for my family. Um, at the time, we were living in an area that had um, only one grocery store and just like corner stores. Um, and because I was now having to think about other people other than myself, thinking about my children, I became really aware of um, the lack of access um, of healthy food. And so my journey started out really as like a backyard gardener, um, you know, trying to grow zucchini and other things. Um, and I just think I like caught the bug um, of agriculture 
um, and realized like just how wonderful it felt to grow my own food. Um, and I also really wanted to um, figure out ways to provide healthier food options for other people in my community. Um, and so I began um, trying to organize a low cost CSA um, through a job that I had at the ARC farm. Um, and from there, um, realized that I really wanted to farm. I was doing like a lot of education and community building work, um, but I just loved being in the soil and felt like I kind of had like a natural knack for it. Um, and so that really started my journey in wanting to, you know, be a farmer full time. Um, and so I spent the last four years working for an organization called Dreaming Out Loud, um, building out their farm, the farm at Kelly Miller in Northeast DC. Um, and then I um, transitioned um, from there last fall and um, started my own farm with my family um, who you see in this picture. So it's named after our daughter, Juniper. Um, and I run the farm with my partner, Blaine, who is an awesome farmer and builder and has maybe built high tunnels or barns for some of the people on this call. Um, and so together we are combining our, you know, years of experience and passions. We have very different passions, but I think they complement each other um, to run a farm that focuses on vegetable production, um, medicinal herb production, um, dye plants, fiber, um, and then seed growing. And then we also um, host different events. So you see this is a flyer for an upcoming event we have on June 25th. Um, called Jubilee, which is inspired by one of our favorite cookbooks by the same name. Um, so the event will feature food from our farm and from other local farmers, and it will just be a celebration of Black farming, food, and culture. Um, so if you're in Southern Maryland and you're interested, um, please check it out and join us. Next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm a mother of three, and it's really my children who I think brought me um, to this place that I am uh, today. Um, so you can see the little kids on the left. Um, that's my daughter and her friend. And that was one of the first community gardens that I helped to manage in DC. Um, and so since my kids have been really young, they've been out there with me um, in the soil. That is a really important part um, of our family's values. Um, is passing this knowledge on to the next generation. My hope is that we can be like Michael Carter's family and years from now um, have a whole kind of family of, of farmers. Um, I think um, as somebody who did not grow up in agriculture um, and didn't grow up um, with their family, um, Farming has really been a journey of like self-discovery for me as well. Um, I was adopted um, and raised in Massachusetts and my adopted parent, uh, my adopted grandparents, they were gardeners. My grandpa grew tomatoes and fruit and berries and he had a compost pile and, and my grandmother grew roses. Um, but I didn't really know anything about um, my birth family um, and our, you know, my history. And so um, for me, farming has really been a journey of kind of reconnecting to the things that I feel um, are kind of ancestral. Um, I can, you know, work with plants and identify them. Um, and I, I feel like that is something that has been passed down um, to me from generations before. Um, and in this work that I've done, I've been able to trace my lineage um, back to um, a tobacco farm in Virginia. Um, and so I feel, uh, you know, I feel like I've come kind of full circle, you know, my birth family, no one farms um, anymore, um, but there are definitely generations who still remember, um, you know, raising all their own food. And I've been able to get some of that information from my family, um, but not all of it. So I'm working to pass that knowledge on to um, all of my children. And next slide. Um, this is my daughter, Juniper, um, who the farm is named after. And so literally Juniper has spent her life on the farm. Um, she was born in 2019, which was my second year at the farm at Kelly Miller. And so I had her out there in her stroller or in a carrier or, you know, in the straw or whatever she was out there 
every day um, with me for a really long time. And so um, we've really just seen how wonderful that has been for her to grow up on a farm space. Um, today, she harvested carrots that she planted a few months ago, and she was just so overjoyed. Um, so it's really wonderful to kind of watch her. And she's always talking about how she's a good farmer. Um, and she's just really excited and, and um, proud of what she's able to do. And so that is a part of um, what we find to be really important um, is really passing this knowledge on to the next generation. You know, whether they want to farm or not, there's no pressure on our end, um, but we want to make sure that they know how to grow their own food and they know where their food comes from. Um, and they're also able to, um, you know, feel empowered um, to work with the earth and, and work with herbs as well. Next slide. Um, so this is a picture of our farm. Um, we are um, in Brandywine, Maryland on an old tobacco farm, um, which is now mainly in conservation easement. Um, so I think we're about on like 150 something acres, um, but a majority of it is in forest. Um, and has a like wildlife um, easement on it. Um, but we do have five acres around the house um, that are not in easement. And so we're able to farm um, right by our house. So you can see in the first picture, there's an old tobacco barn there and that's Blaine um, prepping our fields. Um, and then in the next picture, it's the farm this year, um, we were able to build a whole new barn um, and really work to kind of build the farm space out more. Um, the type of practices we use, um, are, you know, we try to be as sustainable as possible. Um, we do use like a walk behind tractor to kind of till the ground to get our beds started. Um, but we try and do as much minimal tillage as possible once we're able to do that. Um, we do a lot of straw mulching, um, you know, using a, the broad fork and silage tarps. Um, and we know that we have a ways to go in order to improve our soil here because the land hasn't been farmed for a long time. Um, but that's something that, you know, we're really committed to doing. I think it's the basis um, of, you know, both of our loves of farming is to work with the soil and work to regenerate the soil um, so that we can grow food for ourselves and for our community um, and also create, you know, habitat. Um, for all the, you know, beneficial bugs and animals um, that live here. I was weeding yesterday and I found a baby turtle and that was just incredibly exciting um, to know that our farm is, a, you know, can be a space for animals. And right now it's just a buzz with bees and butterflies. Um, so that's a really big, important component of the work um, that we do. Um, next slide. Um, so again, this is just another shot. Uh, this was, uh, was our farm last year. Um, so you can see Blaine is just um, kind of working up the soil um, by hand. Um, and we um, do a lot of straw mulching, which I like, but more and more I'm thinking about, you know, trying other things. Um, I visited another farmer a few weeks ago who has a, a medicinal herb garden and um, all of, she had mulched her whole bed in leaves, um, which I had, you know, read about before, um, but just seeing someone else doing it, um, you know, was inspiring. So I'm thinking about kind of transitioning um, from using straw because we have all this forest around us. Um, and I think a large, you know, a really big part of my farming journey has also been farming in community and learning from other people um, in community. You know, the DMV I think has a really vibrant, wonderful farming community. And so we've been able to just learn so much from other farmers and be in community with other farmers um, and, you know, figure out best practices for the type of farming that we want to do. Uh, next slide. Um, so again, you can see um, we specialize in growing vegetables um, and medicinal herbs. Um, so this is our potatoes from last year um, and our garlic this year. Um, and you can also see that we have silage tarps down. So, you know, once we kind of till up a field and clear it, if we're not ready to plant there right away, um, we'll cover it with silage tarp 
or if we um, are finished with a crop, um, you know, we'll cover it with the silage sharp as well um, and just let things die under there um, and then, you know, pull it back and, and, and work the beds up and plant once all the weeds under there um, are dead. And, you know, we have a lot of dock um, in our fields. So that has been a, a real challenge of, you know, trying to get that up and constantly weed and things. Um, but, you know, my hope is that in a few years, we'll, we will have been able to kind of um, get through all these weeds and we'll have to do less tilling um, and can really have a sustainable farming system and really healthy soil um, so that we can grow vibrant crops um, and really like nourish our community. Um, so cover cropping is definitely a big part um, of my like farming experience. Um, as an urban farmer, I, you know, really wanted to experiment and see how to do cover cropping on a small scale um, on an urban farm. So I spent a lot of my time at the farm at Kelly Miller kind of perfecting um, what that looked like for me. Um, and um, now we're implementing that on our farm here at Juniper's Garden. So you can see we have a field of oats. Um, and because I'm an herbalist, um, they, you know, these serve a dual purpose in that they can be a wonderful cover crop for our soil. I planted oats and red clover together. Um, and then I'm able to harvest those milky oats, um, which are a favorite herb of herbalists. Um, they're a nervine and they're really nourishing and good for your um, nervous system. Um, and so, you know, and the same with red clover. Um, red clover is really good for your lymphatic system and it's um, a cover crop that, you know, will come back each year. Um, so we try and, you know, think about those things and be mindful of the things that we're planting um, and figure out, you know, how can things have, you know, multiple values um, on our farm. Um, this next picture is actually from the urban farm that I worked on. And you can see that big turnip that Juniper was holding in the first picture probably came out of one of these little like holes that, that are in this picture. Um, so, you know, using like daikon radishes um, and turnips and things are also um, cover crops that we like to use, especially if the soil is really um, kind of tough to break through. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are just a few photos of things that we are, you know, growing this year. Um, again, we are kind of in our first season, so we're really kind of figuring things out. I have the most experience as a vegetable farmer, um, but I have grown tired of growing vegetables, and so I'm taking this as an opportunity to really try new things. Um, so this first picture is indigo. I'm growing that for an artist in D.C., um, so she'll be able to come and harvest it and make dye. And I'm also growing um, green and brown cotton for her. Um, and so my hope is to be able to do more things like that, grow more dyes and fiber plants. Um, I'm also a part of the Ujima um, Seed Growers Collective. And so I'm growing a bunch of um, crops for them, which you can see in these pictures. Um, and then some of these seeds were given to me um, by a friend who is a seed saver. Um, and so, you know, my goal is also to grow um, crops that are important to the African diaspora, both for educational purposes and to also save the seeds and to pass those seeds on to the next generation. Um, and then as an herbalist and a farmer, um, I'm passionate about um, helping to restore, you know, native plants um, into our ecosystem. So this next picture is a picture um, of black cohosh. And so my dream for our forest space is to plant um, medicinals like golden seal and wild ginger and black cohosh um, so that we can start to restore some of those native plants that used to grow abundantly here um, in, in our forests. And next slide. Um, and then again, these are my daughters. Um, they out of my three kids, they find the most joy in being in the garden and spend a lot of time there um, with me. So I'm training them. I'm training my middle daughter in Zynga um, in herbalism. So she has a plant of the month um, that she learns about and she'll make teas with and she'll draw pictures of. Um, and so hopefully, you know, that information will be retained and she'll pass that on to the next generation 
And you can see she's teaching um, my youngest daughter, Juniper, as well. Um, so for us, you know, that's a really important part of the work that we are doing is to make sure that our children um, are, are learning this knowledge and that, that then they can hopefully um, pass that knowledge along um, because there's been um, such a break in that knowledge being passed um, to our current generation. Next. Um, and then I think this is my last slide. Um, one of the most important things <clears throat> for me as a farmer is to create beneficial habitats um, for bugs. Um, I, you know, before I was farming, you know, was doing a lot of reading and researching. Um, and that was something that just really stuck with me about just like how important it is to provide those habitats um, so that we have these pollinators that are really, really important to just the function um, of our ecosystem. Um, so I'm lucky that, you know, a lot of the herbs that I grow flower and, you know, bees and butterflies love those. And then we have a lot of like milkweed and other things um, around our property. Um, and so that has always been a really important part um, of my experience as a farmer. Um, and, I, you know, our hope is that we can expand that um, and really like have a space that is um, for people um, and nature to coexist together um, and, and have all of the things that we need um, on this land that we live on. Thank you, Samaria. And there's Tope back. Yes, thank you so much. I was listening to you and I realized that I started talking with my microphone still being muted. So, <laughs> um, well, before I open up uh, the questions, I think you have a bunch of questions that I'd like you to you know, answer in the chat. One of the questions there, um, and we start from the end here. One of the um, questions um, here is, are you making value added products for sale with the medicinal herbs? or using personally with your family? Um, a little bit of both. So as I mentioned, I'm part of, well, a part of the DC Mutual Aid Apothecary. And so some of the stuff that I'm growing is going to make the herbal products that we distribute for free um, to DC community. Um, and then my long-term goal or my vision is to have like an herbal CSA. Um, so right now I'm kind of like in the experimental phase of figuring out how much I can make with what I have, um, but that is my long-term goal is to do value-added products um, for CSA um, and for like wholesale as well. Okay, I kind of like this other question, this next question. I really like it. It made me smile because, you know, I, I have huge respect for you farmers. And this question is, what are your main sources when you get stuck or confused with the crop? Is that for me or for everybody? It's for you, yes. Okay. Um, my main sources, um, I do a lot of like reading and research. Um, my favorite app is Picture This, which is like a plant app that I use all the time. Um, but I have a ton of books. I'm uh, kind of like a book hoarder. <laughs> So I think I'm able to get a lot of information from books, from the internet, from my partner, um, from other farmers. Um, and sometimes it's also just about like observing um, and watching um, and seeing how things transpire. And then also kind of like trusting your own instincts around things and, and, and trying things out. And um, I look at farming as every year is an opportunity to you know, put into practice the things that you messed up on the year before, but learned from. Um, and every, yeah, so every year is another opportunity to just try it again um, and, and do something new. Absolutely. And I always say, you know, farming just for me, like investing is don't be afraid to fail. Because if you're afraid to fail, then you, you can't succeed. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard about, and these questions are all for you, you got a bunch of questions, so I want to make sure I, I answer this, um, you answer those first. Have you heard about mulching with pine needles? Um, I haven't. I'll say I grew up in a really piney place. Um, <laughs> the yard that I had growing up was full of pine trees, and so we could never grow grass. 
um, because it was so acidic. So I'm just very like opposed to <laughs> any type of pine because of that experience. <laughs> so how did you find the land you own now? Um, so we don't own the land, we are leasing it, but our hope is that, you know, we could own it um, one day. Um, we were able to find it just kind of through, a net, you know, knowing somebody in Brandywine who was like managing this property and thought we would be a good fit for it. Um, but my partner does own, um, I think, about 25 acres up the road communally. And um, I think that it was just a lot of like looking for things, working with realtors um, to find a space that was the right space to buy. Okay. Samaria, I love that your farm journey led to your self-discovery through mothering and community and focused towards building generational legacy. Did you find out about your roots to family on the tobacco farm? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, it was here living on this tobacco farm that I found out that my family, the farthest I could trace my family back is to a tobacco farm in Virginia. And I was born in Texas. So it seems like my family was taken from Virginia to Texas before the Civil War. Um, and that's how my family ended up there. Um, but it was through like, you know, ancestry.com of doing that research that I found that information. Okay, and the final question for you before I go to the general key, um, questions is, how do you think having a child grow up on a farm impacts their mindset compared to children who do not? Um, I think it hopefully creates an appreciation um, for good food. Um, my kids know that the strawberries that we grow are better than the ones that you get at the grocery store. Um, and that's a great thing. And I think they, you know, for the most part, really love being outside. Not, you know, my son, he doesn't like to farm. He has no interest, but he loves nature. Um, and that's all I can ask for is that they have, you know, have that appreciation for nature and where their food comes from. Um, and, you know, they're young, so we'll see long-term. <laughs> um, yeah, you're in the um, car now. Please unmute. Oh, could you mute? Okay. Yes. Please go ahead, um, Samara. Oh, yeah. I was just saying um, long term, you know, we'll see <laughs> um, what those impacts are. But I think they feel pretty like comfortable out in nature and confident and excited to, you know, be a part of the farm process. And my three year old is always saying that she it's her farm, you know. It's, it's my farm, it's my garden, it's, it's none of the rest of ours, it's just hers, so. Wow, thank you so much. And we just got handed a gift from Mother Nature because Vanessa is back and she gets to share her experiences because I was already feeling robbed that I have heard about African-American, I've heard about African immigrants, I've heard about, you know, Latino, Hispanic culture in farming. And I'm not, I haven't heard the last piece that I came for because of the weather, but fortunately we're in luck. Vanessa, you have the floor. Thank you, I apologize. We just had a very intense storm go through and knocked out. I did lose corn and one of my Hopi pale grays, which is a very rare seed. It's just gone. So I'll have a lot to, of work to do when this calls over. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from occupied Pamunkey territory uh, here in Richmond, Virginia. And I am the founder of Community Roots Garden. And uh, it has quite a tale to it. If you'll go to the next slide. So uh, the house I live in, which I am a, a renter at, um, I kept looking out my backyard and this kudzu field is what you would see. And I had an indigenous vision one day, a real one. And I saw this beautiful, beautiful community garden. Uh, we live in a food desert and I was like, I think we can do something with this. And so um, I actually spoke to some youth uh, during the BLM movement when things were happening. And I looked out the back window one day in, into my backfield 
and uh, there were some youth out there, some some young folks with machetes just hacking away. Three months later, uh, the garden went uh, became a reality. So we cleared everything. Had a, a farmer come in, and um, we'll go to the next slide. So this is a picture of me in that cleared field. And I just wanna say that uh, my family has uh, farmed, gardened their entire life. But the reality of it is, is that uh, as you can read here, traditional indigenous education was thousands of generations of knowledge and traditions being handed down from family to family member. It gave people a blueprint on how to live sustainably by utilizing the plants, the animals from the region and forced assimilation, stripped generations of all of that knowledge. And we're still reeling from it, but we are very blessed that some tribes and some people and our old people with those oral stories have been reviving a lot of our indigenous practices. So not only did I see this field of free food for our community, I saw the opportunity to help um, renew the earth, to, to protect this piece of property that prior to the kudzu 50 years ago, it had been a bamboo field. And the city decided to bring in kudzu to eradicate the bamboo. And what you saw in the previous slide was what was left behind. Okay, next slide. Okay, so while we were doing this, um, it, this labor of love to turn this into a real garden, um, it, it was a sad reminder of how um, exploited and how abused our earth has been. And this is just a small example of some of the trash that we pulled out. We have estimated anywhere from 20 to 30,000 pounds of everything from car parts, engine parts, uh, glass bottles, uh, concrete. If you'll look at the picture on the right hand of the screen, you'll see that there are things that look like concrete blocks. Those were actually bags of cement that had just been tossed and they turned into that. Uh, you'll see some tires, you'll see Apollo blocks. Well, those are things that we found. Those are things that we found in that field. And instead of taking them to a dump, uh, we decided to utilize them just like we did the picture on the far right with the cinder blocks. And we used that to plant uh, flowers in. So we took things, the old tires, and we showed people you can really grow anywhere and you can use the things that people have discarded that have been abusing uh, the land that you're from and uh, put it to good use. Okay, next slide. So these uh, folks on the left, as you can see, if you, uh, these are some of the young folks that showed up early on and this happened about three years ago and um, that what you see laying on the ground is the flattened out um, <laughs> kudzu. And as we went along, uh, a farmer came in and plowed up the field for us and then tilled it. And we had a group of about 20 people literally walking hand in hand, picking up all of these vines, these roots, everything. Because if you leave one piece of kudzu, it will come back in a real way. Those roots will take over. And uh, the first year we had our garden, it was pretty much straight rows. Uh, people said it would take us three years. It took us three months and we were planting and shortly after able to start harvesting. This year we are uh, working more with our land. So this is a teaching garden. I teach people about sustainability, about soil health, about resiliency of the land. And we have went to more uh, permaculture, which are, is really a fancy word for indigenous practices. And as you can see, there is a, a mound in the middle of here. And that is where our three sisters is growing. And then we followed the slope of the land and created um, rises and um, kind of like berms 
where we do plant, but it also catches the water. So we have to water less because there is no electricity. There is no uh, water out there other than what we have built with our water tanks. And if we don't get rain, uh, we, we can't water. Next slide. Okay, um, here again, this is uh, what the garden is looking like now. Our three sisters on the right in the mound. And here are some folks every Sunday, we have people come out and, um, and they weed and they farm and they learn and they talk. And we've added um, a lot of things to the garden. We have a bat house there. The ladder you see in the picture is actually a ladder that was discarded in our neighborhood. And there's actually two of them. And we used those to trellis beans and squash up uh, last year. And then this is on the far right is some of the things that we harvested. Next slide. This right here is something we've added this year. And uh, it, is a, it is a herb spiral. This will be permanent. And we do have plans to build another one. It grows um, culinary and medicinal herbs. All of the things that come from our garden, the medicine that comes from the garden, the vegetables, we've planted uh, indigenous plants. We have wild plum, wild cherry, uh, pawpaws, um, just a lot of, oh, elderberries everywhere so that we can bring back the plants that are traditional there, but these herbs will be shared throughout the community, not just uh, for eating, but our, our herbalist, I'm an herbalist, and we'll harvest those and that will go uh, become free medicine for our community. And the smaller picture is, um, this was taken uh, just a couple of days ago, actually, and that's kind of a view from the back toward the front of the garden with just a few of the things we're growing. This year we're growing turmeric. Uh, we grew, actually grew um, our first ever uh, Napa cabbage, which were massive and bok choy. We're growing a lot of indigenous varieties of squash and beans, including um, some African varieties of beans and different vegetables and gourds and squash. So that's something we're uh, very excited to share. The echinacea and the sunflowers in the picture on the right are all things that are medicinal, but also beautiful and will draw in all the pollinators. It's been really a hard year for us for pollinators. There's not been as many as in the years past but um, I've been able to teach some folks to hand pollinate. So we're doing that and we do have plans in the future to have beehives so that we can harvest true, um, true local honey for our community. Like I said, we are a food desert. Um, the nearest pharmacy to me is at, at least a mile and a half away. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it can be for a community, especially the older black community that lives in the neighborhood I do. And so right now we are facing such a hard time in the world. Um, we are facing a lot of challenges with COVID. We are uh, facing uh, a lot of challenges with just politics, everything that's happening in the world. And I kind of laughed about this when I first saw it. And it, sometimes it feels like the world's burning and I'm just back here playing in my garden. But that space that we have created as a community has brought peace and beauty to so many people's lives. We find people out there all the time, all the time, just sitting and reading. We've had college students come and do their classes there or in their Zoom classes. We have people who just need a break from the world who will come out and start reading come out, start and, reading, talk, come out, and talk. talk. Uh, Vanessa, we can't hear you. I have no clue how that happened. But if we could go to the next slide. Oh. 
There it goes. So this was just a beautiful picture I, I saw and I wanted to share with everyone that nature will find a way. It is a, a beautiful uh, way that we live in harmony with the earth. And I hope that um, people will embrace indigenous wisdom and listen become more sustainable, uh, rejuvenate the land that you're on, uh, honor it. It is a living, breathing organism. And um, it's very special to me to be able to share with people as they're planting that we are nurturing the earth, not just our bodies with the food and the medicine we grow, but we are nurturing the earth. And I think that's the last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, I'm so glad that mother nature returned you to us or allowed you to return to us. I believe we have a couple of questions for you before um, we open up the general Q&A, which we have a little bit about maybe 20 minutes to take all the questions. But um, Christian asks, why do you think some people doubted the amount of time it would take you guys to start? Well, it wasn't to start, it was to be able to plant. So people said, that is kudzu. You will not eradicate that kudzu. It's going to take you at least three years. And uh, what they did not take into account was our resiliency as people, but also that indigenous vision that I knew that's what that space was supposed to be. And I knew that it was going to happen, but there were many, many people, including farmers and other people were like, this is not happening. As a matter of fact, the farmer who came out and plowed the field looked at us and just said, this is crazy. It is not going to work. And when he started plowing and pulling up those kudzu roots, and we did pull out some rocks and cinder blocks and stuff out of there that was just insane. When he was done, he said, I've never seen soil that look this beautiful. He said, let's see what happens. So now he's a big believer that you can grow food anywhere. You just have to have that vision and you have to stick with it and you have to work with the land. Don't fight the land, work with it. We did have to clear the kudzu, but there's a whole nother area that is just full of it. It is not invasive. It is medicinal. The roots are used to treat alcohol addiction, to clear the liver. The leaves are edible. The vines have been used to create baskets and wreaths. Yes, it is a nuisance plant, but it also has its benefits. Everything in nature does. And that is so true. You know, my husband and I went to a property in Baltimore today and my untrained eye, I looked at him and I said, we can't use this place. It is a mixture of wood and grass, wood and grass, and it's more, I could see more wood. And he said, if there's no um, conservation easement to protect the forest, we could clear some of it and there is good soil under here. So until I saw your slides, I didn't believe him. I thought he was just being optimistic, but there is really, now I believe that it's really useful and you know the, the earth is definitely calling us. Um, um, there's a question here as well. What was the main issue you found within your soil? And I think you spoke about this, but you could just answer that briefly. Actually, we did not do any soil testing uh, when we first started. Uh, I looked at that soil, um, I, I, without sounding hokey, but following uh, indigenous wisdom, following my gut, listening to my ancestors, yes, yes, and following that vision and knowing what it was, I knew that soul was rich and beautiful and good. Remember, this had been a kudzu field for almost 50 years. The kudzu roots, if you're not familiar, is like a big mycelium, there's big knots, there's all these things. It had broken up that soil and it was just pumping it with nitrates. Our beans, our squash, our corn, everything exploded almost overnight. I knew that was good soil. I just knew it. You could smell it. You could see it. And I believed in it. Other people believed in it. And I knew it wasn't going to fail. And that sounds like a thing, but we could get our, and, and we do know this for a fact, uh, we will probably get our soil tested just to see what's going on, but it's organic. 
uh, since we've known it's never been sprayed by any chemicals in, in at least 50 years, it, it, or the kudzu wouldn't have been there. Um, it Nothing has grown there. There's never been any, um, nothing like miracle Grow put in it. Um, 99% of our plants are uh, heirlooms and um, indigenous and really old varieties that we've gotten from different people and people have donated to us. So we will be seeing what's in there, but there's never been anything built there. There was never a house. It's just been this big empty field that leads down into a ravine that is supposed to be a watershed for the city. And we have goals of hopefully moving on down that ravine with uh, terrace gardens, uh, flooding out the bottom where there is a very, very pitiful little creek that needs remediation, flooding that out and growing wild rice, and then starting up the other side of that ravine. Um, it's a project I won't live to see come to fruition, but there are other people who work in the garden who will. Hmm. Wow, thank you so much. So I'm going to use the remaining about 17 minutes to ask a couple of questions. And I'm going to start from Josue. And um, I just want to, you know, to take you back to one of our pre-discussions before we um, convene this panel. You use, you know, no chemicals on your farm. That is very ambitious. How do you control pests? Because somebody sitting down here thinking, I need to spray this thing to get rid of the pest. How do you deal with pest control? Well, I, I see Vanessa handpicking and that's, I will say that was first two years, there was a lot of handpicking, but you know, I think that's where the integration comes into play and having the other animals, uh, having the ducks on, on the property and having the chickens uh, here now in year, I said year four, I guess it's been three with the animals. I mean, we are seeing nowhere near the amount of pests this year as we have in the previous two years. I mean, we've made it this far. I'm going to knock on wood right now, but we have not seen a Japanese beetle. We have not seen um, uh, squash borer. We haven't seen any of that. And I think I, I would owe a lot of that to, to being integrated with the animals, you know, where we're, we're letting that happen. Um, and then also just the quality of the soil. It was just pure, heavy clay that was super dense and you couldn't get through it unless, you know, you were one of these... Uh, bugs and now that it's definitely more tilth and you know the, the animals can access it easier too so i think it's a lot being integrated is helping in that do you want to add anything to that? the road covers um the oh, white covers oh, yes. top covers Floating. um that has worked for us as well for the greens uh and also we rotate our crop and i think that has helped a lot I saw a conversation in the chat about sorrel earlier, uh, and uh, we put that in our high tunnel on purpose because of, uh, you know, it, it's susceptibility, but it's it's survived and done well on its own in the high tunnel. Mm, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to Michael next. So we just had Juneteenth, and for me, every day is Juneteenth because there's a reminder as a person of color trying to farm in America of the elephant in the room. That elephant in the room is land access. How has that journey been for you? I know that your land has been part of the family, but there are people who have had land in their family who have lost it as well. What are the challenge? What what do you see as the ways for people of color to be able to access land for farming? Great question. Um, biggest challenge first and foremost is perception of land and changing your perception about what land is and how much value it holds. Um, we are a very unique people and that, you know, when we want something, we'll get it. You know, we've made various brands, very successful that have been, you know, higher priced and, you know, and, you know, luxury items. And we had to kind of utilize the same strategy, uh, with land. The land should be in the same category as Gucci and Louis Vuitton and Air Jordans in terms of our desire to acquire that and to kind of show it off. Um, it's usually not a a matter of, of capital as much as it is a matter of what you value and spend your money on because we spend our money on things that generally are not as uh, productive from a social standpoint because we have you know historically put a great value on land it does prevent us from actually accessing it um, there's land and then our perception about where to buy land you know urban land is not the place to go find you a lot of land for a decent price 
but in these rural areas in Southwest Virginia or just Central Virginia, um, South <clears throat> Southern Maryland, other parts of Maryland outside of PG County and Montgomery County, um, and Howard County would assist a lot in uh, us gaining access to more land. Uh, but it is about priorities and about where you place your money, your interest. Um, it's not an easy thing, and it takes a, a you know, as the sister was saying earlier about vision, it takes a lot of vision to see the value of land. You know, I applaud my ancestors for you know seeing 150 acres and saying we're going to purchase this for our family, not knowing myself, not knowing my father, or my grandfather at the time, but having a vision to know that if we had this, they would have this as well, uh, as long as it's instilled and they'll see to maintain in them. Um, so you know, that's my biggest takeaway with land, land access. We need to, as a community, place a lot more value on land and land ownership. Um, and kind of plot our land, our land like you would a Escalade or Mercedes Benz. Uh, usually, land is cheaper than those items. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. I hear you loud and clear. And I'm going to go to Samaria next. And I want to talk about, you know, not only are you a person of color, Kwame, you're also a woman in agriculture. And this is these two combinations are things you know that can often be a barrier. People look at me sometimes and say, can I talk to the farmer, the hus your husband? And, but I want to ask you in terms of the profitability of you know, um, agriculture, how profitable do you think this venture is going to be? And how do you, you know, balance that strive for profitability with the barriers you face as a woman and a person of color? Um, my hope is that it can be profitable. Um, I'm looking at this farm project as more than just growing plants, but also offering um, an event space and an educational space and, and a retreat space. Um, so, you know, my vision is for it to not just be farming that is providing income for us, um, but that it's a kind of a whole ecosystem and that all of the skills that we have can contribute um, to making it profitable for our family. Um, I'll say my background is in nonprofit farming because I have been afraid to like take that risk in the past um, and go out on my own because I have kids that I need to take care of and my partner runs his own business. So it's, it's helpful for me to have a stable income at all times, um, but I'm getting more confident in myself and I just got the Braiding Seeds Fellowship, which will allow me to farm 20 hours a week, um, which is a dream come true and super exciting. Um, and so I think like if there could be more opportunities like that, like that is an amazing opportunity um, for me as a farmer and for the other farmers who are able to participate in it. And I think as we're thinking more about how do we get more, you know, farmers of color on land, like that needs to be the model that people are using um, to really support us because, you know, we're owed that money. We're owed reparations. Like our families have, you know, built this country and suffered so much. Um, and so we, we need that boost that everyone else, you know, has been able to get that we haven't been able to get. Um, so that this can be something that can sustain us. Um, and I don't know if I really think about being a woman farmer. I just know that like, I know I'm strong and I know I can work hard. Um, and that is what really like drives me. And I think that people see that, they see that I am a really hard worker and that like, I, you know, put my all into everything and then, you know, have faith in me um, to be able to execute, you know, whatever it is I, I need to undertake. And I think I'm maybe like stubborn and just like, once I have a goal, I'm just plowing ahead until I reach that goal. Um, but I, hopefully me being a woman farmer, um, inspires, you know, other women to know that this is something we can do. And I see, you know, more and more people who are getting into farming are women. Um, and so that's a really exciting thing to see. And I think that that was something that that is an innate within us, you know, when there's been like this gender divide. Um, but I think that, you know, hopefully we're moving away from that um, and recognizing that, you know, women are just as strong um, and, and can farm just like everyone else. So, you know, uh, one of the privileges of being from West Africa, from Nigeria, is that 
I saw the place in Nigeria, in Badagui, as well as in Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, where the slaves were brought, where they, were, where they started their journey. And then I got to see the South Carolina side a few years ago when they arrived here. And that kind of just honestly did my head in. But yesterday I saw this, um, I saw this uh, flyer that somebody had shared on Instagram and it says Negroes for sale by public auction on Thursday, 10 a.m. the 12th of April, 1848, prime and healthy at Old Donald's Auction House in Charleston, South Carolina. One of the things they said about this Negroes that were for sale was 25 field hands trained at hoeing, chopping, trashing, bale and plowing, peaceful lot, no troublemakers, strong, can walk in the heat all day long, being taught to drive wagons and fetch quick, they're quick learners, 18 women, eight with future insurance, all house trained, clean cooking, irons, mixed beds. But, you know, this, the first thing, and this advert is very long, there's another female that they said her thing is that she's, a, she's an excellent seamstress. When I saw this, the first thing that came to mind was I was very upset. I was very angry. Then I thought about it and I said, we are the answers to the prayers of all of these people who were auctioned, who were stolen, who were put into this forced labor, but they probably in their minds thought about a time when their children or their children's children will do this work under the sun for the entire day and be paid for it. So now I'm beginning to see farming and the opportunity to do so as a person of color, as a privilege, and as an answer to the prayer of their ancestors. So I'm hopeful that you know, I can continue to see it that way. Which brings me to you, Vanessa. We cannot talk about, we can talk about labor and talk about black people and some other races. But in terms of indigenous people, you know, every time I think about land access, I get really mad because all of this land we're trying to access belongs to indigenous people. And you made a point during your presentation, you said you are on rented land. How does that make you feel? And what do you think we need to do to get this land back to the hands of those who really own it? Thank you. Um, I just want to say that in this continent, this continent, we don't recognize the imaginary borders was filled full of indigenous people, millions upon millions of them. And genocide has now left us in the so-called United States, 2% of the population. Of those 2% of the population, 0.6% uh, of them are farmers. That's it out of 2% of the population. Uh, I'm proud to put myself in there, but I know that all indigenous people or the majority of them do. And when we talk about, uh, there's a whole movement out there, land back. It's like, give us our land back, give us, give us back our good land because where they put us were on reservations and in very undesirable areas that has very poor land. Our people have overcome a lot of that. And the ones that got to stay in their lands have worked with that land for thousands of years. They work with very little amounts of water and are able to grow crops and do and grow the things that grow in their area. And when it, when it comes to me, um, so that garden you saw, that land, right now it's about an acre that we have cleared. Uh, only a small portion of that land belongs to the house I live in. The rest belongs to the city. And this native took the land back. I did not ask for, for permission. I took that land back. They were not being good caretakers of it. They didn't do what they needed to, to help the earth. Uh, they didn't plant indigenous plants. They brought in things that had never been here. I took the land back. Now, before anybody can get out, <gasps> um, the city workers who worked because it's right next to a ball field, saw what we were growing, were so excited. They told the city about us and the city did come out and uh, they loved it. And they were very supportive and offered to help us. And we're like, 
nope, you've done enough. We're good. And so I, I took the land back. And there are other indigenous people who are doing little community gardens in their areas when they find these empty uh, fields. But there is a very powerful movement. And, and it's important to remember that treaties were signed with many, many, many of these indigenous tribes across this country. And um, their land is held in trust. And instead of allowing indigenous people to farm it or ranch it, they rent it out uh, on the reservation, reservation lands they are in control of and they rent it out to white farmers to graze cattle and these things. Well, it's time, it, your, your time's up. And uh, many tribes are putting the government on notice. It, you're done. Uh, it's time for you to pay rent, and it's time for you to move on. So it, it's a it's a very big deal. Um, a lot was taken. Uh, a lot was lost. And we are now re rebuilding, re remembering, learning our languages, learning our practices and our traditions. And um, yeah, it's been beautiful and. Just a quick reminder that uh, uh, yesterday, and this is important because of, of what we're talking about right here, is yesterday, Arville Looking Horse, who is the carrier of the white buffalo calf woman's pipe, um, since he was, I think, 12 years old, put out a mass call across the country, across the world, for people to go out and do ceremony, do prayers, do something, and pray, pray for this earth, pray for the land. And I went out, I did my ceremony, I, I did my prayers, I followed uh, my traditional beliefs, and um, I did it in the garden. I, I, we were asked to go to sacred sites, and that is a sacred site. So there are indigenous people who are stepping up and saying, hey, this is what we need to do. Hey, we need to restore this. We need to learn these languages. We need to put, give you the knowledge so that you can be good stewards of the land so that you know how to treat it and uh, to, to heal the water, to heal the land. We have that knowledge. We've been here forever, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years before uh, the professionals say we were. We've been here and it's been proven. So. That's it. Um, some people are taking the land back. Some are asking for it back. And some of them are saying, government, uh, time's up. Your rent's due. <laughs> oh, my God. I really, really like that. You know, I want to, I have just about a minute or two, but I want to make sure that I don't miss asking Gloria and Hussoy this question. The regenerative farming is a buzzword these days. And it's like, you, you, I actually have to go check the dictionary what exactly it means one more time. What is different between what you're doing and what you see being advertised and promoted as regenerative farming? And how, how easy or hard is it for you to maintain that you know, grounding? I, I think there's there's a lot in there, but it's it's growing with the purpose is the bottom line. It, it's it's not just throwing seeds out there for the commercial benefit or potential, but I think as everybody who's been on this panel has talked about, it's it's that um, innate being that's a part of us. You know, we're feeding the soil, and the soil's feeding us. It's something that we've said a lot in other conversations that we've been a part of. And in regenerative agriculture for us is, is really a part of that. It's that the, the personal health issues, the stewardship issues that we're talking about, the respect for the land and the respect for our personal histories and connection to land. I, I think that's what's beneath all of it in the practices and the way we uh, it materializes in the fields is, is on top of all these other things that I mentioned that are the underpinnings of what regenerative agriculture is. Very good. <laughs> Let me stop that with for us. <laughs> very, very good. And you've left me some time to ask Michael this question that has been on my mind for a while. And that is, Michael, people would look at this farming that all of you have beautifully described. All of these cultural practices, all of this good treatment of the earth, all of this stewardship that you all bring to the earth. And they would say, at the time when this was practiced, 
There were only two people in Maryland. Now Maryland has, and I just made that up, and Maryland, now Maryland has 20 million people. How can we continue to farm this difficult farming on a large scale? We need to feed people and we need to make profit. What do you say to those people? Agriculture and animal farming properly. Because um, the large scale things that we do generally are not for vegetables. They're generally for grain crops like uh, soybeans, corn, um, wheat, and things like that. When was the last time somebody ate some raw soybeans outside of a dime? It just doesn't happen. Uh, or or dent corn, uh, dent corn, and things like that. We don't eat that that much. You generally can feed a decent amount of people in a very small space. Uh, and in the American food context, we waste so much food that it's almost ridiculous for us to talk about feeding others without the excess rate waste that we have built into the system. So you can easily feed uh, quite a few number of individuals with the right crops on a very small scale. Uh, what you cannot do is create an industrial food system on small lands. And that's what we have to kind of balance out. What are we trying to do here? Uh, the United States has taken on this idea that they need to feed the world. And I'm not sure if the world actually said, or asked the United States, to, you know, we don't need you to feed us. I think you, I may ask you for there. I'm sorry. Um, um, okay, Michael, are you there? I, I'm here. I got my backup because okay. my internet is always tricky as well. Yeah. So if you can hear me, hopefully. Um, yeah. So, you know, what, what becomes is our perceptions of what farmers should do and what food should do and how we should eat our foods. How much food do we actually throw away on a regular basis? How much processed foods do we eat that we shouldn't be eating? You know, when you go into a grocery store or, you know, there's a health food section. Why does that even exist? If that's health food, what is the other food on the, on the shelves? You know, and usually the health food section is the smallest section of the store and the least utilized section. And that's what most farmers grow is their healthy foods. I've never grown mac and cheese in my life. <laughs> I'm not sure if any farmer has ever grown mac and cheese in their life, but that's, you know, that's ideally, you know, I've never grown a Frito-Lay, uh, a Tachi or a, you know, a Dorito. And I'm not sure if any other farmer has ever done that as well. So we have to really reevaluate our food, our food perspectives, how we see our nutrition. When you reevaluate what you need to do to be healthy, you'll change your view about how to be healthy. Mm. When you reevaluate your view to being healthy. Wow. That is, that is deep. And I just want to share one personal experience and then I will hand this over to our gracious hostess, Elizabeth. For a couple of years, for many, many years, I would go to the hospital because I had chest pain. Like I, I, at some point I thought I was dying. And then one day um, I went to University of Maryland a hospital in Baltimore and the doctor said, you know, this is like um, some, something with heartburn, like it means heartburn in English. And then the doctor said, you need to stop eating tomatoes. I was like, I'm Nigerian. I have to eat tomatoes. I have to eat pepper. He was saying, rule out all of these things. And then for a while I, I did stop and I noticed that the chest pain kind of stopped as well. But when we started Dodo Farms in 2018 and we started growing our own tomatoes with absolutely nothing but tomatoes. Now I've been eating tomatoes forever. I eat it every day and I eat the hottest pepper and I do not have any chest pain. None. So it means that really this food is the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to nourish our body and not hurt our body. And so for everyone who is listening, who is here, please support a farmer that is trying to grow real food for us. Please support. And the best way to support is to buy from us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for inviting me to host this panel. Thank you to all of the panelists. I really learned a lot. I have a note full. And I look forward to engaging with everyone soon. What an exciting conversation. I, um, I've got goosebumps over here. It, it's just thrilling to hear from all of you. And I'm uh, really grateful. I do want to pause on this slide one last time just to remind folks to connect with the Million Acre Challenge in order to stay connected to each other. 
one of the most important parts of our work is building farmer networks. And we want to do that in a diverse, inclusive uh, Chesapeake region manner. Um, and this is one of the ways that you can do that. Um, we'd love to continue to hear from you. Our email addresses are at the bottom. Our farmers have put, largely have put their um, website information in chat and they were also part of some of our original um, promotional materials. We'll try to make sure that that circulates back out to folks. Um, I want to just pause and offer sincere thanks to everybody um, who was part of this. Our uh, amazing program coordinator, Adrian Granston, who has been sort of off, off camera. You can come on and wave, Adrian, because she has been the one orchestrating much of the coordination behind the scenes. Our moderator, Tope Fajimbasi, to our excellent panel of speakers, Josue, Gloria, Vanessa, Michael, Samaria, and to all of you in the audience for spending this time with us because it means that you're engaged and interested and trying to learn and build your knowledge about indigenous and BIPOC practices. Uh, we hope this will be the start of an ongoing conversation and an ongoing relationship uh, as we take the Million Acre Challenge and the work of these producers into the future. Thank you very, very much. We will be posting this uh, recording on YouTube, Million Acre Challenge, uh, YouTube channel, and we'll get that out to you all um, as soon as we can. If there are last minute questions that came up in chat, I'm happy for folks to entertain those. I did see a question about how did you all find your niche, which seems like a little bit much to tackle in the last two minutes, but if somebody has a quick answer that they want to pop into chat, um, feel free. But I think all of these folks would be willing to have connection afterwards off, off camera. So. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to folks individually. Any final comments? No, oh, it's been raining so hard here, but my internet made it through. So I'm grateful for that as well. Thank you all very much for the work you do. Thank you all in the audience for the work that you're going to do to support this cause. And we look